Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. We lift you up. We praise your name, Lord God. Hallelujah. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you with our hands. Thank you as we stand on our feet. Thank you with our voices, Lord God, with the air you put in our lungs. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. Thank you, God, for what you're yet doing. And thank you, God, for every minute, every day, every week that you give us moving forward. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning and praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. Welcome to everyone here in person. And I want to welcome everyone who is joining us online. As I think about, I hope you all had a blessed uh, Thanksgiving day, uh, everyone. And I'm certainly grateful for a tremendous amount in my life. And as I look out here, I know that Thanksgiving is supposed to be, we, they say that it's a Christian holiday, and yet when I look out, I see a skeleton crew. Amen? Amen? Thank God for the skeleton crew. Thank God for those who are holding it down today. Amen? For For God's Glory Ministries. We pray for everyone that is sick and shut in. We continue to pray for all those who are on our prayer list. And if you, we, I think everyone picked up a prayer list on the way out last week. Amen. But if you want to know the exact names that we want to lift up to the Lord, for the Lord, feel free to call or email our office and we will get you a list. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm very mindful of what's happening in the Middle East. And so we are grateful today for the fact that we have hostages, Israeli hostages that are being returned. Amen. Hallelujah. And the exchange between Israel and Hamas. And uh, we are just so grateful that the bloodshed has stopped. Amen. Amen. Even if for a while, even if it's not permanent, we're grateful for every day that folks don't have to worry about bombs falling on their heads that they didn't do anything to cause. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to remind everyone that this uh, tomorrow starts our consecration. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to be praying in midweek together from 7 p.m. to 730 on Wednesday. And I want us to focus on forward progress in this ministry. I think it's quite ironic on Thanksgiving Day and on Consecration Week upcoming that before I got here today and, and, and realized that we had a skeleton crew, that I want us to pray for forward progress in this ministry, in this church, amen? amen. And not just corporately, but individually, forward progress. We're grateful for what we've been able to do up to this point, but we want to continue to march forward in the Lord, amen? amen. Doing his will, his way, and in his time. Amen. amen, amen, amen. Now, I can tell you now, I couldn't tell you last week, and I know Pastor Trina said, oh, she didn't get a download. She usually has a sense even though I don't tell her what I'm going to pray about. But I already told you last week that we were having a series of two to three weeks on the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because we need to be more familiarized, more aware, amen, about the Holy Spirit, particularly in these times. Well, I can tell you now that it is a three-part series. I tried hard. I fought. I scratched. I clawed. I did everything that I could. I thought it could be a two-part. But it needed to be a three-part series, amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And as a result of last week, I hope that we now understand from that message that the Holy Spirit has been ever present. He was here from the beginning and he had a very important part to play in the Old Testament. From Genesis to Malachi, we tend to think of it as something that just happened on the day of Pentecost. But the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. Amen. So how can we put him in small letters? Amen. How can we make him an afterthought? Hallelujah. And so today we're going to endeavor to point out the fact that he continues to be a prominent part in the New Testament era. Amen. And we're going to look at the Bible and we're going to see that in the Bible. Amen. Now, it may not be very surprising to you all because most people are very reasonably familiar with the New Testament, but that's okay. 
We're going to title this message, Holy Spirit Revealed in the New Testament, to match last week's, although I know that it may not be such a revelation to everyone. But we tend to forget. We tend to not notice. We're going to, today we're going to teach you some things, but we're just going to remind you of other things. We're going to notice some things that we don't often notice because we're looking at the shiny object. We're looking at the big deal. We're looking at what we tend to focus on in the scripture. Amen. And so we're going to, and for, as far as the text this morning, we're going to be focused on, now we could focus on a whole lot of stuff if we want to highlight the Holy Ghost, but just in the interest of time and emphasis, we're going to focus on the Gospels. We're going to focus on the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking a little bit at the book of Revelation, okay, so you can get your Bibles ready. We're going to be focused on the Gospels. We won't cover all the Gospels, but we will have a representative pieces, a couple representative pieces of it. We're going to look at the book of Acts, not all of it, but we're going to look at the portions to make the point of what we're trying to get at, which is the Holy Ghost has been present. He has been active. He's been involved. He's been intricately involved Amen. in all that God has done here on earth as it relates to man. Amen. And we will look at the book of Revelation. Amen. Let's bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us to this day, to this moment. Lord God, we are, have an attitude of gratitude. We are so grateful, Lord God, for all that you have done for us. And we thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do for us today through your word. We thank you. We praise you. We lift your name up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. And I just want to, you know, I wanted to say it earlier, but I just want to say thank you to every single person, every single person is part of the, what I'm calling the skeleton crew. But, but even those who are not here, but that are so intricate, intricately involved, amen, <laughs> I apologize, in what we do, who are so important to what we do here for God's glory ministry. We, we are small but mighty. We're small but mighty because of the precious Holy Ghost. We're small but mighty because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're small but mighty because of our Father, our God, and the fact that we take what he's given us and we give of ourselves. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so each and every person, whether you think what you do is small or whether you think what you do is large, I want to take this moment and declare for myself that I couldn't do what it is that I do for this ministry without those of you who make the wheels turn, amen? amen, who take care of the office, who handle the administration, who actually do a little security, who are greeting the people when they come in with a howdy, praise the Lord, amen, and with a, with a smile and with the love of the Lord, who watch the children, amen, who carry my Bible, who handle the audio visual, Pastor Trina with all of the greetings that she does on the phone and texting in the morning and everything that she does to watch over what happens here uh, every single day. I thank Sister Glenda for all of her prayers during the week and on Sunday and her presence if she's not traveling. I just want to, I, I said I wouldn't name names. Amen. But everybody that's on the nursing home ministry team, amen? amen? Hallelujah. Everyone that's involved with the scholarship program, everyone involved with the, with the homeless and, and, and those who are less fortunate, amen? amen. Everything that we do, amen. everything that we do, those that help us with our, with our uh, 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 internet, services hallelujah whether it's youtube or whether it's uh, facebook everybody that does anything that has anything to do with this ministry i say thank you amen. i say thank you amen. i say thank you amen. Amen. amen so i have an attitude of gratitude this morning i am grateful to each and every one of you in jesus name amen. Amen. and now that we focus in on the New Testament, like I said, it won't be a revelation to most of you because you're familiar with the New Testament. Amen. But I'm prayerful and hopeful that we can just slow down just a little bit and pay attention. Can we do that? Amen. This might be, it just might be, the first time in a long time that it really felt like a Bible study. Amen. I know that's how it sounded and looked for me as I prepared it. But we're just going to slow down. And we're going to pay attention and we're going to emphasize and become more familiarized with and have a good grip and grasp on the Holy Spirit. We now know, I hope, that he was present and involved and impactful in the Old Testament where we don't expect to see him. Amen. But he was there at creation. Amen. Amen. 
He was there at all the critical times in the Old Testament. And I hope that last week helped you to know that, helped you to understand that, helped you to be confident in that. Because we serve a triune God. Amen? Amen. Now, when I came up early on in my early 20s, I was involved in ministry and it was Jesus only. Hallelujah. We only wanted to hear Jesus. Everything was Jesus. Don't talk to me about no Trinity. Don't talk to me about what they call the Godhead, which is actually a misnomer, by the way. We've covered it. But don't talk to me about the Father, the Son. Don't baptize me in the Father, name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, 19. Don't do that. Don't say that over me. It won't count. Now, I don't say any of that to beat anybody up. It's just to say that we are emphasizing the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I know those who believe in Jesus only are down with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because of Acts 2 and 38. But what I'm trying to tell you today is as we highlight the Holy Spirit, we get a chance to embrace fully the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen? That is a gift. And God decided that this was the time to highlight his precious Holy Spirit for us. And so today we will emphasize the New Testament. And again, since you are probably familiar, we will be reminding you, we will be slowing down, noticing some things. Are you ready to notice with me this morning? Amen. Are you ready to notice with me this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, not all of the Gospels are written the same, so they don't emphasize the same things. Matthew starts out with a genealogy of all things. But when we look at the book of Luke, he starts out from the very beginning of his depiction of the gospel message, amen? amen. Of the gospel story of Jesus here on earth. He starts right out with the Holy Ghost at work. He starts immediately showing us that the Holy Ghost is present and he is impactful. Where John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Ghost before he was even born. Amen. And his mother at the same time, when he was five and a half months pregnant, John and his mother were filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was on the scene early on and active. Amen. Amen. We tend to forget that it is the Holy Ghost that made Mary pregnant. How can we forget that? How can we de-emphasize that? How can we minimize that? If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, we wouldn't have a virgin birth. If it wasn't for the virgin birth, we would not have had the Jesus that we had. And we did, if we didn't have the Jesus that we had, then his blood would have meant nothing. Amen. And the plan of the Father God would not have come to fruition. The Holy Ghost was there early and often from the, from the beginning of creation all the way through all of the Old Testament. And he showed up and showed out as we begin the New Testament. Hallelujah. 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 The Holy Ghost wasn't new in the New Testament, but he sure was busy. The Holy Spirit, if you recall, descended upon Jesus. At the moment of his baptism, amen, in the form of a dove. And the father said, oh, my son, I'm so proud of you. I'm paraphrasing. Hallelujah. But he stated his pleasure, amen, over what Jesus had done up to that point and his confirmation of what he was going to do here on earth. Amen. And as a result, John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. And he also said after that, he said, I indeed baptize with water, but Jesus, or he said the one that shall come, but he was talking about Jesus, he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and what? Fire. Amen. The Holy Ghost and fire. Hallelujah. And so now he showed up and he was impactful in the New Testament. He was impactful in the Gospels. And we're going to come back to the Gospels, but are you willing to go to the book of Acts with me now? I think it's enough to say that he filled John the Baptist and his mother with the Holy Spirit. I think it's enough for now to say that it's because of him that we have the birth, virgin birth and we have the salvation that we depend on so much. I think it's enough, amen, to talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit came down and Jesus was there to be come down upon and the Father spoke. And so we have the Trinity right there. There is no ignoring it. There's no denying it. There's nothing wrong with it, amen? amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to the book of Acts, and this is where we get to open up our Bibles. 
If you open up your Bible to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at the very first few verses. As we slow down and pay attention, as we slow down and acknowledge the presence, the ministry, the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The position, the person of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It reads this way. The former treatise, uh, Luke, of course, writing, the former treatise, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he what? Through what? Okay, I'll read it again just so we could all get there at the same time and say at the same time, to whom also he showed himself alive, um, forgive me, unto, this, <laughs> unto the day in which he was taken up after that, he through what? The Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. We actually fail often to recognize and realize the intricate bond of Jesus and the Holy Ghost in fulfilling the plan and the will of God on earth as it pertains to man. We read it. But we don't notice it. We read it, but we don't internalize it. We read it, but we don't realize Amen. to our detriment Amen. the movements, the impact of the Holy Ghost and how the Holy Ghost and Jesus the Son work together on so many occasions. Amen. Hallelujah. On our behalf. Amen. And so he, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he has chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. We know that Jesus was raised on the third day and that he walked around showing folks and teaching folks, letting them know that he is alive and so therefore we can live. Being seen of them for 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of who? The Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly what? Baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Do you see how Jesus and John the Baptist were on the same page? Do you see the continuity? Amen? Amen. In the gospel, in the Bible. And so as we see here, Pentecost had not yet come. Yet we already see the Holy Ghost. That's what I'm trying to get, make, make very, very clear. He didn't show up in Acts chapter 2. He was there at creation. He was there all through the Old Testament. He showed up and showed out before we ever got to Pentecost. Amen. Hallelujah. He was present. He was active and directly intertwined and connected with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We see the whole Trinity right there. And I think it's beautiful. And so it should seem natural, therefore. No matter what denomination you call yourself from, it should seem natural that Jesus in the Great Commission and Matthew 28, 19 said, go out and teach all nations, meaning all peoples, baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the what? Father. And in the name of what? The Son. And in the name of what? The Holy Ghost. It's easy to forget that. It's easy to dismiss that. And sometimes we even are daring enough to minimize that for many reasons. Hallelujah. None of them good reasons. Some, some folks may, may have good intentions, but they're not good reasons. Hallelujah. And then in Acts chapter 2, we get the fulfillment of the fire baptism that was promised. Amen. And that John talked about and that Jesus just referenced. And it happened in the upper room in Jerusalem. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And it shouldn't be far from where you already are. And we're just going to look at the same number of verses. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5 as we reveal 
the Holy Spirit in the New Testament as we acknowledge the Holy Spirit and his movement and his involvement and his presence and his person and his position. Biblically speaking, amen? amen. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it reads this way. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of what? Fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with what? Other tongues. Not unknown tongues. Other tongues. Amen. Meaning tongues other than their natural language. Languages that they had no business knowing how to speak. Other tongues as the what? Spirit gave them utterance. Sometimes we forget. We talk about the tongues. And it was miraculous. How did the tongues come to be? It's not that they said what they knew to say. The Spirit gave them what to say. He was showing up and showing out. I told you he was here before this, but I know this is where we think he showed up. So many of us, imagine his birthday, if you will, being Pentecost. Amen. After Jesus ascended back to heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as the spirit gave them utterance and there were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So this may seem familiar to you all, but this was the fulfillment. This right here. We ended, I believe it was last week, talking about the prophet Joel and how he foresaw the fact that there would be this infilling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This was the fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. It wasn't the Holy Ghost's birthday, but it was the fulfillment of prophecy. Hallelujah. And it also fulfilled the promise of the Father given through Jesus that there would be another comforter. There would be another helper when he left. He would not leave us comfortless. Amen. But the Father would send the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this fulfilled that promise. And so the Holy Ghost wasn't new, but he was doing a whole lot. And there was one thing that was new here. Let's notice something, amen? There was one thing that was new because we went through the Old Testament last week, so that pro provides you a foundation for what I'm about to talk about now, briefly. One thing has changed. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was present. He was involved, amen? He gave fellowship. Folks had him around them, but very few were filled with him. Very few were filled with the Holy Ghost. It is a big deal. We may take it for granted after we get saved, after a few months. It's not new anymore. It is a big deal yeah. Amen. to be infilled with the Holy Spirit, not just to have him with you. As David cried out, not wanting to have the spirit taken away from him. But it is a big deal to be filled with the spirit. And it is very difficult, it is nowhere near as comfortable to live the kind of life that some folk claim that they can live and still be saved. It is not easy, it is very uncomfortable, it is very disconcerting to have the Holy Spirit inside of you, knowing you're fighting your flesh, but just to let the flesh go because there's grace around. It's not easy. Your works do not save you, but your works certainly show what's inside of you. Amen. What predominates? Do I see a picture of Christ or do I see somebody that chose to put on a label because can't nobody stop them from putting on the label? Can't nobody stop them from saying I belong Amen. to Jesus? Amen. It's not easy to have the Holy Spirit inside of you and act like the devil. It's not easy to have the Holy Spirit inside of you and live according to what the world says is okay when you know inside of you that God says it's not okay. If you can do that easily, if you can do that and sleep easily at night, something's up. Amen. Something's up. Amen. This is love speaking. Amen. This is telling you the truth. Amen? Amen? So this is the one thing that had changed. It was rare in the Old Testament to be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
And so we should not take it for granted. Amen. So what we see here, as was promised in the book of Joel, that not only would somebody be filled, but many would be filled and many were filled on that day of Pentecost and many would be filled beyond that. Amen. After that. Hallelujah. And they spoke with other tongues. May sound, oh, that's cool. But because they spoke with other tongues, this amazing phenomenon came about. And there were already people from all over the place there because of all the festivals, amen, all the way from Passover. And they stayed over to Pentecost. Well, other folks came because they heard of this amazing phenomenon. And guess what happened? They heard prophecies being, they heard prophesying, they heard God being glorified in their language by folks that, you Galilean, you come from Cyrene, you, you don't speak my language, you don't speak my dialect, how in the world could that happen? But guess what? Because of that, they all went back to their places and spread the gospel. They all went back to their various places of abode, their various places of residence and began to do God's work. So it wasn't just a cute little miracle. It had impact. It had purpose. And guess what it was done through? By the Father, through what? The Holy Ghost. Yes, through the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think that's awesome. It facilitated the growth of this infant church. The Holy Ghost facilitated the spread of the wonderful gospel. Again, the Holy Ghost at work. Amen. So easy for us to catch that the day we get saved, especially in an apostolic church or a holiness church. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. But it's nice that we are stopping. We're taking these three weeks and we're noticing, we're appreciating, we're becoming even more familiar with the Holy Spirit and his work and his person and his position in the Trinity. Amen? Now, to further highlight, are you getting a little more familiarized with the Holy Ghost? Tell me you learned just one little thing. Make me feel good. Say, I learned one little thing, Pastor. I didn't know it all. What is that? Hey, two things. Hallelujah. I feel good. I can go home. Let me close my Bible up. Quit while I'm ahead. But, but to further emphasize and highlight the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit's position. If we were to read the book of Matthew chapter 12, and we will go there. As a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and turn there just to give you a head start. Matthew chapter 12. Hopefully we already understand. Think about what we, we've learned about the Old Testament and the Holy Ghost. We've learned about the Gospels and, and, and the beginning of, of all of what we call the New Testament and the Holy Ghost. We've acknowledged the time that some folks think the Holy Ghost came to be in Acts 2 and 38, which is, of course, not true. We have a lot of background now on the Holy Ghost. But to further highlight it, Matthew chapter 12, what you'll find is Jesus having done a bunch of healings and then he cast out some demons. And they were upset with him about doing it. And they had the nerve to say that Jesus must have cast out the demon, demons by using the power of the devil. They had the nerve to say that. And I won't go verse by verse, but I will say this. As Jesus addressed them, he basically said, no, I cast out demons by a power greater than the demons. And he called that power the spirit of God. The same as the Holy Ghost, the same as the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, no, 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 no. If a, if, if, if a, a strong man's house is going to be taken over, you got to take over the strong man. You got to be stronger than the strong man because he would never let you take his house. Amen. And so he says that and references the spirit of God through which he did it. Come on, Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, but he wasn't done. Just in case you're wondering if I, I'm giving the Holy Ghost more a higher billing than he deserves, let's just hear Jesus. Let's go to verses 31 and 32. Same chapter, Matthew chapter 12. Are you with me? Amen. All right, verses 31 and 32. 
We're talking about the, 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 the position and the prominence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. So you can do a whole lot and, and be forgiven. But, say but, but, but the blasphemy, amen, which means basically slander. This term is actually taken from a legal context. Blasphemy, to, to, to tell a lie and therefore to harm the reputation of one. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, does your Bible say Holy Ghost? Amen. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, what? Shall not be forgiven unto men. He's not done, he goes further. And whosoever speaketh a word against what? The Son of Man. I'm Jesus, I'm the Son of God. Anybody that speaks a word against me, it shall be forgiven him. He didn't explain why. I believe it's because you're just giving man a little bit of grace, uh, cutting him a little bit of slack because Jesus walked around in the form of a man. Amen. He walked around looking like a man. So maybe you think you can throw shade at Jesus. I'll cut you some slack because I look like a man. I took on the form of a man. I eat like a man. I sleep like a man. I have pain like a man. I have feelings like a man. I'll cut you some slack. So, a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But, whosoever speaketh against what? Against who? The Holy Ghost. It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. What does Jesus think about the Holy Spirit? You speak against the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so now he's referencing, he did the work, he did the healings, he did the, 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 the casting out of the demons with the Spirit of God. If you wondered if he was talking about the Holy Ghost, do you wonder now? I don't think so. It's all there. And it's all in red. And so Jesus is saying that the unforgivable sin, so this is a, a trivia question. <laughs> this is a quiz question. Somebody somewhere in your life is going to say, what is the one unforgivable sin? Most people instinctively would say, what? Suicide. Most people would say suicide because the Ten Commandments says thou shalt not kill. Same thing as abortion. They would say thou shalt not kill. But in this case, well, I'm killing myself. And guess what? If I kill myself, I have no more breaths left. I have no more life to repent. I have no more opportunity like the thief on the cross at the last little bit to find out who I am and why I am and what I am and what I need and to ask for it and receive it and to go home to be with the Lord in the nick of time in his case. But one who commits suicide, we will talk about this. On a, that's not the topic. <laughs> we will cover that when it's time to cover that. But most people instinctively think if you ask them, it's suicide. Most don't realize, don't know that the one forgivable, unforgivable sin that was stated in the Bible is right here. You know exactly where it is now. Mark it, highlight it, underline it, crinkle up the edge of the page so that when that question is asked, you have the answer. Think about it. We're talking about disrespecting. Lowering the reputation of, slandering the precious Holy Ghost. When you talk against him, you're talking against God. When you talk against the Holy Ghost, you're talking against the Father. When you're talking against the Holy Ghost, you're talking about the elevated son. He'll cut you slack while he's still down here. The one unforgivable sin is to slander the Holy Ghost. Does it say that in your Bible? Does it say that in your Bible? Yes. I'm not, I said I'm slowing down. Does it say that in your Bible? Yes. Does it say it in red? Yes. Did Jesus say it? Yes. About the Holy Ghost. Yes. I think that's some kind of marvelous. Yes. I'm not done. Fast forward. After the day of Pentecost, all of them 
You know, they didn't keep their own stuff. They sold land and all, they, they had things in common. Nobody had lack whatsoever. They lived communally. We're not requiring that of us, but they lived communally. And then we had some folks who sold their land and oh, they got all sorts of credit. And you know, when people get attention and credit, you know what other folks want, right? Attention and credit. But you all likely know the story where Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife, sold a piece of land and had the nerve to lie about how much they sold it for. Mm. Ouch. They lied about how much they sold it for. So then when they gave, it would look like they gave more than they did. They held some back. Boy. What, what, I'm about to tell you what happened to them. And just imagine if this is what happened when we steal from God and when we lie. Uh-huh. 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 Yes, Lord. I talked, I talked, I think a few weeks ago, I said, the one thing you don't want me to do is to, is to make public your internet search history. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, some folks don't want, to, don't, don't want their bank accounts to be made public for this reason. Not for privacy reasons, but because they also hold back on God. Amen? Amen. But Ananias and Sapphira lied about how much they sold the property for so that the, the people can believe that what they sold it for was what they put at the feet of the apostles. So that they can look good as opposed to be good. So that they can look good and do some good, but lie about how much good they're doing. They want the credit and the money in their pockets. But what happened to them? This didn't happen very often. It happened a couple of times in the Old Testament, and it happened here in the New. They were struck down dead, given an opportunity to tell the truth. But bam, why were they struck down dead? Because they lied to Peter? Because they lied to Matthew? Because they lied to John? No, they thought they were lying to man, but they were lying to the Holy Ghost. And he talked to Peter, talked to them about the fact that you thought about this. You planned this. You ignored the Holy Spirit. You ignored God. Stole from him, lied to his face. He doesn't need your money. He certainly doesn't need you if you're going to be this way. Amen. Amen. And so they were struck down dead, not for lying to men, but because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And if you go back to the text, it says they lied to the Holy Spirit and therefore they lied to God. Do you see the elevated position? Do you see the impactful place that the Holy Spirit has always had and still does today or should? Amen. Amen. This is the position. So the Father, the Holy Ghost is not just the third thing that you mentioned in the Trinity. And I'm about to show you something where he's not even the third thing. And one of these days I might be able to preach to you how, talking about what we're going to learn in here in just a second, how it relates to the sanctuary, how it relates to the temple, how it relates to the tabernacle, how it relates to the holiest of holies and the holy sanctuary. And the altar. Hallelujah. Ooh, I'm going there. I said I wouldn't. Mm, mm, mm. So they were killed instantly. The husband first. Then the wife shows up. Okay, I heard that you sold this property for this much. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. See, now you conspired with your husband to tell this lie. So you both tell the same lie. Guess what? The person, folks, the young men who are going to bury you, I can already, already hear their feet. Boom, dead. Why? That's drastic, right? They were given a chance to tell the truth. But a liar is a liar. A cheater is a cheater. And yet they were there, likely, on the day of Pentecost. But that doesn't mean anything if you don't really care about God. And if you don't care about the Holy Ghost, you don't care about God. Bam. Struck dead. So by now, I would hope that the presence and the significance of the Holy Ghost is really apparent. Is it apparent? Do we have clarity around how significant and meaningful the Holy Spirit has always been? So now let's go to the book of Revelation. I promised you that, so let's go there. 
Revelation chapter 1. We are learning about the Holy Spirit. We are being reminded of, of the Holy Spirit. We are paying attention. We are noticing some things as it relates to the Holy Spirit that we might not have noticed before. We might have been reading along and amazed by all that was happening and missed who it was happening through. Miss the power and the presence and the person and the position of the Holy Spirit. So Revelation chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. You can read along with me. Of course, John is opening the book of Revelation, and the drama builds as he writes. But what I want to highlight is just simply a part of the introduction as John writes it. He says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from, say from, grace be unto you and peace. John the apostle on the island of Patmos having endured boiling oil for the name of Jesus, for preaching Jesus. John, that John, he writes to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from. From him which is and which was and which is to come. This is a way to describe in many cases the ancient of days, which is a description of Father. Amen? God the Father. There's one occasion where the same, after all power was given unto his hands, and we look at the book of Revelation further, even Jesus is associated with this terminology as the Father gave over to him. Amen? That kind of glorification. But again, from him which is and which was and which is to come. And say and. 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 From the seven spirits which are before his throne. So you know now that we're talking about God the Father, right? We know now that when he said from him who is and was and which is to come. Now he's saying the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now we all know about the heavenly abode, right? If you go over to chapter 4, you will see John actually seeing what is being described here. And so the one who is and was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before or in front of his throne, which is who? Who, is the seven, who are the seven spirits? That is the Holy Ghost. We've talked about this before. Amen? Those seven spirits that are before and they're in the form of a fiery flame before or in front of, I may have to, just based on what I'm hearing, the feedback I'm getting, I wasn't planning, but I might have to go over to chapter four and make sure that you all know that he's not just making the significance of this. So, and from, so this letter is coming from, I'm writing to you from, I'm speaking on behalf of God the Father. Notice he didn't do the Son next, he did the Holy Spirit. This is why if you talk about the holiest of holies and, and the, 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 uh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant, amen? And, and, and the cloud which represented the father sitting between two cherubim. And then you go into the holy place. From the holiest of holies across the, the curtain, we go to the holy place and what do we see? The lampstand with how many candles? Seven. Representative of what? The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Mm -mm -mm. So the seven spirits, he chooses this language because he's been blown away by the imagery that he saw, which he explains further in chapter 4. So grace and peace from God the Father, from the Holy Spirit, and, verse 6, 5, sorry, 5, and from Jesus Christ, 
who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Now that, that it, notice it says unto him. He's, he's basically after he says also grace and peace to you from Jesus after he said the father and he said the son. Now, now sorry the Holy Spirit now he's saying the son. He's actually giving honor to Jesus unto him that loved us and washed us from his sins in his blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God. This is verse 6 and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So I had to include six so that you could see why he pivoted there because now that he's said the father, now that he said the Holy Spirit, now that he's introduced the son, he's emphasizing, he's heaping praise onto Jesus. See, ain't nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to heap praise onto Jesus, but it doesn't mean we leave out the Holy Ghost. This is the book of Revelation. So from Genesis, the very first two verses, all the way here to Revelation, we have the Holy Spirit represented. We shouldn't have to go there, but we need to. Amen? Hallelujah. So we see here all of the Trinity being included, not leaving out the Holy Ghost. All of the Trinity, all of the triune God being represented. But we had to cover it because we might not notice. We might not notice Let me see if I can find that verse. I hope I have time. Mm. Where is it? Where is it? Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, Go go to Revelation chapter 4. This is unscripted. This is not planned. Hallelujah. This is John in chapter 4. And uh, let's see. Uh, he, He takes a few verses describing the place and describing with an amazing description, Father God. And then he says in verse 4, and round about the throne, the throne that we were just talking about, right? The throne that the seven spirits of God are in front of. And round about the throne were four and 20, meaning 24 seats. And upon the seats I saw four and 20 elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. This is the heavenly abode, the heavenly throne room of God. So there were seven lamps of burning fire before the throne, which are what? The seven spirits of God. This is what John was talking about. Now, it's not a coincidence that the Holy Spirit, when it came down uh, to to fill them, it didn't come in the form of a dove. It came in the form of fire. I don't want to be too presumptuous, but I'm not surprised that God showed up as fire to Moses and didn't burn the bush. All I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit is repeatedly represented as fire. And so John was telling you, I bring you grace and peace from God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. All I'm saying is that we might not notice. And so we're today endeavoring to notice. Is that all right? And I'm almost done, just in case you wondered. But I want to do one more thing for you, and then I look forward to next week. But I want to further for you emphasize the oneness of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the purposes of God the Father. Are you willing to go there with me? None of these parts of God hate on the other, but we need to understand and embrace and uh, acknowledge them all. So to further emphasize the oneness of Jesus and the Holy Ghost, uh, let's go to, uh, uh, we're all actually almost there. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5 where Jesus is about to open the break the seal on the book of mysteries of all the future events. You know about that. And when he broke the seal, the first thing we saw was a white horse. That was the fake one. That was the Antichrist. And then there were three other horses that gave uh, a voice to or the imagery of all of the difficult things that were going to happen during the tribulation time. 
But as we see here, Jesus being the only one being found worthy to open the book. John was crying, saying, oh, my God, he took the book, but there was nobody worthy of opening the book. But then the angel said, that's all right. Don't cry, John. There is one that is worthy. There is one that is worthy. And that is Jesus, the Lamb of God, was found to be worthy. And so we see here in verse 5, it says, and one of the elders saith unto me, I said an angel, I apologize, it was one of the elders. He says, weep not, John. Behold, meaning look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. Jesus is worthy to open the book. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And to loose the seven seals thereof and now let's read verse 6 and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders in the middle of this whole scene stood a lamb as it had been slain having what seven horns and seven eyes, which are what? The seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. You could not have a biblical depiction of how Jesus and the Holy Spirit are intertwined than this. So again, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are directly connected and intertwined in executing the plan, the will, the desires of God the Father as it relates to events here on earth and in particular, mankind. Now there is so much more that we could cover, but I promise you we would be done soon, amen? And so we will wrap up. But I believe that what we've covered today, if you add that to last week, it should be enough to convince us. You should be thoroughly convinced at this point, amen? amen. Of the significance of the Holy Spirit. You should be thoroughly convinced of his eternal presence and impact of the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. And his oneness with Christ. You should be thoroughly convinced. You should have all sorts of pages crinkled up on the corner. You should have all sorts of highlighting, underlining. You should have an impact on your heart and your mind. So that the Holy Spirit is not an afterthought to you anymore. That you would realize that he is significant. He is ever present. And he has been impactful since day one. Since day one, in terms of the work of the Father here on earth and his plan for mankind. So as I promise, I'm closing. So it's Thanksgiving weekend. And so I, I also, in addition to thanking you all for everything that you've done, thank you everybody that's here. We had a few people that came after we began. Thank you for coming. I pray that you've been blessed. But I just want to thank God. I want to thank God for allowing me to serve him. I want to thank God for trusting me to do what he says do when he says to do it. And I want to thank God for any correction, anything he wants to change in me or do with me. I thank him in advance for it and I welcome it. Thank God for this education today and these reminders of the precious Holy Spirit. And so next week, and I'm thanking him in advance for next week, we're going to we're going to wrap up the series as we highlight the power of the Holy Ghost and as we focus on his ministry in us, especially at a time like this. I said we're going to focus on the power of the Holy Ghost and focus on his ministry in us, particularly at a time like this. Do you have a foundation now for that? I could have just broke out and started talking about that, but you would not have all a common foundation. We will come to that third part of the series, all having the same 
common foundation and understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and his significance and his presence and his impact and his person and his position in heaven. And therefore, in us as he indwells us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we will focus on those things uh, next time as we endeavor to embrace and understand uh, the implications of world history as we're living it today. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, for all of your many blessings, Lord God. Thank you for this day. Hallelujah. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. And thank you for your purpose, Lord God. Thank you for using us, Lord God, to do your will. Amen.